Every year, more than three billion air passengers head for the skies. The vast majority return safely to Earth without incident. But a small number experience life-changing moments they will never forget. It was like a war zone in the sky. We hear first-hand accounts from the passengers and pilots who have lived through the most shocking extremes of air travel. Went on the wildest teacup ride you could ever imagine. From great escapes... Run, run, it's gonna blow. ...to mad moments. And highway robbery... This is now gonna cost you £24,000. ...to highway landings. Holy... It's definitely something I don't teach in driving school, so to avoid a plane. In the age of the smartphone, these events are caught on camera as never before. Awesome. We reveal exclusive footage never seen on television. So keep your seatbelts fastened for the world's wildest flights. In this episode of World's Wildest Flights, we may end up in the Hudson. What happens when a jetliner with 150 passengers loses both of its engines over one of the most heavily populated areas on Earth? I knew we were going to crash, and at that moment, I was almost 100% confident I was going to die. We hear the story of the greatest escape in aviation history, the miracle on the Hudson. Also, plunging to Earth in shocking storm conditions. The plane just sunk like a stone and crashed into the ground. And panic on a burning plane in Peru. The oxygen mass started falling. Everything inside the plane was destroyed. Everyone was getting desperate. 15th of January, 2009. New York, USA. The time and place for an event now famous as the most successful ditching in aviation history. But for Ben Bostick, heading home to North Carolina after his first ever trip to the Big Apple, the day started much like any other. We were rushing around, you know, getting, trying to finish up, so we'd get the car and take us to the airport. We are looking at the, you know, radar, seeing the snow coming in. Uh, I snapped a few photos out on the street. It was snowing, but it wasn't like that bad yet. It was kind of pretty. Ben is booked on US Airways Flight 1549 out of LaGuardia Airport. The weather started coming in and pushed our flight back. The flight eventually leaves nearly 20 minutes late. When we were taking off, I was already into my book because we had to sit on the runway for quite a bit. That was part of our delay, so I wasn't really paying much attention. Yanis Crumbs is also heading home. He's rushing to get a ferry from Manhattan to New Jersey before the weather sets in. I think I was the last person on the ferry coming back trying to cross the Hudson River, and I ran on, and that's when they pulled up the gates and they we were off. Sat down and got on the phone like most people do. It's a quick uh, five minute, six minute uh, cross across the river. Um, and yeah, I think I got on Twitter even. Scott Gross and Tom Paratori work for the security team at energy supplier Con Edison. One of their responsibilities is to monitor the company's security cameras, which overlook the Hudson River. I was actually at the manager's desk at the operations center, and I was just doing typical daily paperwork. I was in the office all day. Normally, uh, the day-to-day -day operations would take us out into the field. I was happy to be in the office because it was a brutally cold day. Flight 1549 has been in the air for less than two minutes. Then, at a height of about 3,000 feet, the Airbus A320 plows through a flock of Canada geese. I heard a loud boom when the geese hit the engines, and it was like a loud series of thumps. I mean, the plane shook really violently. As I turned left and looked out the window, and I could see the left engine on fire. At this point, the airliner is about five miles northwest of the departure airport. What was going through my mind was, please come over the radio and say we're going back to LaGuardia. That's all I could think about. There are thousands of bird strikes on aircraft every year, 
but usually the plane has at least enough power to return to base. This case is unusual though. The geese caused catastrophic damage to both of the jetliner's engines. One burst strike is dangerous and a super annoyance, and then you still have your other engine to get you out of the problem. When you lose not just one engine, but two engines, that's the part that's unheard of. We practice single engine flying all the time. Not a problem. We can climb out, we can do whatever necessary. But for him to lose both engines at the same time, that turns that airplane into a glider. That airplane was still flying, but it wasn't going to be flying for long, and they had to make some decisions. He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. With no power at a height of 1,600 feet and an airspeed of about 240 miles per hour, the pilot, Chesley Sully Sullenberger, realizes that he won't be able to get back to LaGuardia. We may end up in the hot seat. I was continuously looking out the window, but it was so horrific, you know, I couldn't take my eyes off of it, um, just the engine burning. We were above one of the most densely populated areas in the world. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever been involved in in my life. The captain, Sully, has to find somewhere to touch down, and in a heavily inhabited area like this, there isn't a great deal of choice. You cannot land straight into uh, buildings. That, I'm sorry, but that's not a, an option. Not when there was water around, because water is the same thing as going out to a desolate area. And the Hudson was perfect for that. You're away from buildings, you're away from people, you're away from population. Now, the fact that you have to, to set up to land in the water with no engines, that is tough. There's no pilot that envies Sully for having to make that decision to land in the water knowing that when you hit, with even with your gear up, it's like hitting concrete. We're gonna be in the Hudson. The pilot doesn't have time to explain the situation to the passengers. He can only prepare them for an emergency landing. He said, this is your captain, brace for impact. I took a peek up. I knew we were gonna hit the water. I knew we were gonna crash then. My heart fell out of my chest. At that moment, I was almost 100% confident I was gonna die. Just five minutes after takeoff, at a speed of about 140 miles per hour, the plane crash lands in the Hudson River. So when we made impact, you know, it was really violent. There was a couple twists and a couple tilts where, you know, it felt like, oh, we're, we're going to flip or something like that. Fortunately, we didn't because he hit it just right. Captain Sully's got an entire career behind him. But pilots who have careers behind them don't land in the water. When you're in a situation like this one, you're making decisions based on your understanding of the airplane and the world around you. So you have this airplane that may sink right away. That water was freezing cold. I mean, everything that was against them. And still yet, he was able to land that airplane. <laughs> awesome. The Con Edison camera picks up the downed Airbus just seconds after the crash. The actual camera itself was aimed at the pier, but once I panned up to the center of the river, that's where you actually saw a wake. And I panned the camera down, and that's when we actually saw the airplane. I was just amazed. So Scott said, hey, you got to see this. I didn't expect to see what was on the screen. I mean, nobody expects to see a, an A320 floating down the river. Once we came to a stop, I remember looking down at my hands and I was like wiggling my fingers. And I don't know why, because I mean, I got bigger limbs, but I looked at my legs too eventually and said, oh my gosh, I'm in one piece. You know, I actually survived the impact. Just a few hundred yards downstream, New York Waterway Ferry Thomas Jefferson sets course for the ailing airliner. The captain came on, uh, on the speaker and said, hey, there's a plane in front of us, and we're going to go in for the rescue. Everyone rushed to the windows and tried to see what was going on. And um, so I you know, initially saw the plane. I was like, OK, wow, this is in incredible what's going on here. But even as the ferry powers towards the aircraft, it's starting to sink as water floods in through a massive hole in the rear section of the fuselage. It's already up to my knees. The back of the plane was taking on water much faster than the front, because that's where the damage was. 
So there's people behind me that is probably by now in waist deep water. There are 155 souls trapped on a fast sinking plane on the icy waters of the Hudson River. It's a race against time as a flotilla of ferries rush to the aid of the stricken Airbus. October 2013, Somerset, England. Microlites are small, lightweight aircraft, usually flown by amateur aviation enthusiasts. They have a reputation for being somewhat accident prone. Sometimes with disastrous consequences. But one man who walked away to tell the tale is John Merriman. John is a farmer, scuba instructor, and something of a jack of all trades. But for many years, he also longed to be a pilot. So he started looking for a plane to buy. Always interested in flying, but never had a chance to fly. I found a, an X-Air, which I realized was quite an easy aircraft to fly. So I decided to buy it got someone to fly it back to my strip in Somerton. John signed up veteran commercial airline captain Chris Harrison to show him the ropes. Uh, he had a desire to learn to fly, um, as a lot of people do. So much so that he bought himself a small aeroplane and then he looked to me to teach him to fly in it, which I did. And I have to say, and I know he won't mind me telling you, that he was one of the difficult students. Flying didn't always come easy for John, and he did have one particular weakness, getting the plane back to ground safely. Didn't get on very well with the landings, that was the problem. Um, that dragged on for a long, long time. Every time I came in to land, I, I got the airspeed wrong, and Chris had to take control at the last minute. I think I visited most parts of the runway with him that I'd never seen ever before. <laughs> Though I suggested to him at one point he might like to consider doing something else like take up vintage cars or motorcycles, he said, no, I want to, con I want to carry on, if you don't mind. I said, well, all right, then we'll stick with it. And eventually he managed it. All of a sudden it's like a lot of these hobbies and sports, you, you just clicks and you, and you don't know what you were doing wrong and it all comes together. After about 30 hours of training, John feels ready for his first solo flight. Once I started um, taxiing down the runway, full power up. A little bit nervous to start with. Um, it's, it's a strange thing going up the runway with no one in the passenger seat. Um, your instructor's not there to help you if, if you do have an issue. Chris is keeping a wary eye from the ground. Everybody that goes solo the first time, they don't really want to do it. Once you're airborne then, you get up to, say, 100, 150 feet, you start looking, you've got no one there, so it's obviously a bit creepy. You're on your own. So that's a bit worrying to start with, to be quite honest. See the two tall trees on their own? He would have taken off just to the left of those and headed out towards the hills. Every student that takes their first flight, you watch them intently all the way around the circuit. Obviously, the nerves started to kick in as I started to get nearer the landing point. He did a perfect three-point landing and rolled in with a big grin on his face. John is flushed with success at his first ever solo flight. If only it had stopped there. But his instructor has other ideas. Chris said, do you want to do another solo flight? I didn't have a lot of time that day, actually. I should have been back home. But I said yes, so uh, I carried on, started my second solo flight. So he took off in that direction over there, climbed up to about 700 feet, made a right turn, go around the circuit. A bit more relaxed this time, because I'd done one, exactly the same as before, power up, got up to about 50 knots, pulled the stick back. So I thought, yeah, this is going to be a good one. The engine starts stuttering, then cuts out completely. 
stops, just basically stopped dead, um, like as if something had gone bang in it. The crankshaft has broken, so the plane has no power at all. Well, the first thing, you, you, you feel a real utter silence. It just, everything goes, it becomes like a glider. There's no noise whatsoever. You naturally start slowing down. And the aircraft started dropping fairly quick, uh, a lot quicker than I expected. And then all of a sudden, I heard on the radio, mayday, mayday. And I looked out, and I could see his aeroplane descending. John is now about 800 feet up in his microlight without any power. He searches desperately for a safe spot to bring the aircraft down. You're looking for a, a preferably a grass field, um, quite a long one, preferably flat. Overhead cables are the important, important thing. They're very hard to find. You can see the poles, but you can't see the cable. So that's something you've got to be very careful about. Did see a field right ahead, which looked a good option, and uh, basically went for it. At about 300 feet, I noticed some electric cables. At that time, I had to make quite a serious decision then. Was I going to fly over the cables and land, or was I going to fly under them? and decided there was only one option to land in front of them. John drops like a stone to avoid the power cables, then hits the field at a terrifying 50 miles an hour. Quite a drastic descent, and then I levelled off up the field. Unfortunately, just 50 yards along John's improvised landing strip, there's an irrigation ditch. It's a rut in the field which took one of the undercarriages off. The aircraft comes to an abrupt halt. Obviously, he was out of sight at that point, so we all jumped in vehicles and went off to look for him. I'm OK, OK. Gone out, jumped out, looked at the damage, quite upset, but at least I was walking away from it. Yeah, that fast plane around on land again. Yeah. Chris and another guy from the uh, airfield came over to help. Chris was quite happy, he uh, said, said I was a, a really good job. He managed to get out and I could see him go, hmm, that's wrecked my plane. <laughs> but at least he walked away and he did a good job of it, I must admit. John's aircraft was a write-off, but the crash hasn't put him off flying. He's bought himself a new plane and he's happy to be back behind the yoke again. I still love flying. Uh, try and fly whenever, whenever the weather's good, to be quite honest. It's probably taught me quite a lot, a lot more than you'd, you'd learn from, a, from an instructor. So, uh, yeah, it's done, done me a lot of good, I think, really, yeah. 15th of January, 2009. US Airways Flight 1549 has ditched in the Hudson River after a flock of geese took out both engines of the Airbus A320 less than two minutes after takeoff from New York LaGuardia Airport. A security camera on the nearby Con Edison building tracks the plane as it drifts seawards. You weren't quite sure what was going on. You didn't know how it happened or what had happened. Here's a plane landed on the water, is in one piece, Doors are open, people are disembarking off of an aircraft and staying on the wings. My worries were that the plane would sink before the, the rescue operation could be completed and that uh, the loss of life would be uh, huge. Yanis Crumbs is on board a New York waterway ferry, racing to the aid of the stricken airliner. We see this Airbus floating there and it was like, that was, uh, it was scary. Also, the scene that we were going to approach to, it was going to be um, potentially very um, gruesome because you don't expect people to survive that. Ben Bostick was one of the 150 passengers trapped on the jetliner as it drifted along the Hudson River. Today, he's come down to the Carolinas Aviation Museum in his hometown of Charlotte, where the restored plane is now on display to explain how he managed to escape from the waterlogged aircraft on that fateful day. 
I was in the back on this side of the plane, uh, row 20 out of 26. We couldn't use the rear exits because they were damaged and underwater. So opening them would just bring in more water and water was already coming in really fast. So when it got to about my knees, the flight attendant said, we gotta go forward, gotta go forward, climb over to seats. I kept climbed over to seats till about row 12. That's when I noticed the flight attendant who was standing right outside the cockpit. She was motioning for me to come forward. She apparently had a lot of room on the rafts when the wings were starting to fill up. She directed me out this door. It was roughly similar to this with a, with a raft in it. She says jump, so I jump, slid down the slide into the raft, and it was roughly half full. When I got there, by that time everybody was out, it was jam-packed. Ben is out of the aeroplane, but he's still standing in a packed raft up to his ankles in icy water. Fortunately, help is on the way. It was just a matter of three or four minutes before we actually saw the first ferry beginning to approach the aircraft on our camera. I'm thinking, all right, we got hope here. People are helping, just like New Yorkers do. They, in a crisis situation, everybody bonded together. These captains took their vessels and drove it toward a plane that could sink, damage their vessel. They put themselves into harm's way, rescuing these people. Yanis is on the Thomas Jefferson, the first ferry to approach the aeroplane as it drifts down the Hudson. As we were pulling up to the plane, me and a bunch of other passengers were taking photos, and I took a pretty dramatic photo just because of where it is and what the situation is, and um, that's what I put on Twitter, tweeting, uh, there's a plane in the Hudson going in for the rescue. Crazy. Very uh, eloquent. <laughs> Yanis's photo spread like wildfire around the world. Perhaps the first time social media had broken news in this way. But for Ben on the raft, the arrival of the Thomas Jefferson was the real good news story. Seeing the ferry was beautiful. Felt like, you know, okay, I'm gonna survive. That was my first sense of like, we're getting out of this thing. There was staged senses of how safe I was from the time I thought I was for sure gonna die to the time I thought, maybe I got an 80% chance of survival. When I saw that ferry, I was probably up to about 98%. It was pretty much quiet, dead quiet, and there was a, remember a baby crying. There's no noise at all, the people were just staring at us. They were just in shock, they were just, you know, they were freezing and they were trying to get off that plane and get on the ferry. The ferries weren't designed to approach an aircraft. They're designed to approach a fixed height pier where you know they know how to get people on and off of a ferry. How are you gonna get people on and off of a, a ferry from a wing of an aircraft? So just to see the crew manipulate and jockey around, and get the gear in place, and get it, everything just right to make sure those people did not fall into the water. Relief, utter relief. The deck of the ferry, I want to say, was probably about seven feet above the raft level. So they threw down, you know, the rope-style ladder that they had, and that's how it got up to the top. But the, the crew members of the ferry, they were laying on the deck, on their bellies, reaching down as far as they could to help us get up. The crews are on the edge, and then we were the second wave of people trying to help whatever way we could. Uh, one of them was a stewardess who had broken her leg, and so I was one of the people who helped her carry her inside and then put her on a bench and see how we could help her. The people on the ferry were great. They were, like, giving us gloves, giving us their jackets. You know, it was super cold that day, but they wanted to help any way they could, Just taking us to the heating vents on the ferry. They knew where they were. They rode them every day, right? And giving them, giving them prime real estate on the ferry. I took a few pictures. I said, I have to, like, I have to get pictures of this because I can't believe it happened, you know? Is it real? Am I gonna, like, wake up from a bad dream or whatever? And uh, it just, it was just so surreal. That's the first thing I did was look back at the plane. Once we saw the last few individuals board the uh, ferries and the ferries begin to move away from the actual aircraft itself and head towards safety, uh, that's when I knew that things were going to be okay. The moment that I really felt like that I could totally relax was not until I reached land. I was just happy, uh, happy to be alive, hoping everybody else made it off 
okay or you know it would have been a totally different outcome for all of us even if one wouldn't have made it. All of the 155 people on board flight 1549 made it safely to shore. Thanks to the skill of Captain Sullenberger and his crew and the New Yorkers who came to their rescue as the Airbus sank slowly into the icy waters of the Hudson. February 2017, Edinburgh, Scotland. Gary Campbell is a professional card player who travels around Europe playing a game called Magic the Gathering. He describes it as a cross between poker and chess. I fly probably two, three, four times a, a month to various tournaments around Europe. Generally between 1,200 and 2,200 players turn up to them. It's been a lot of years since I did so well, but I really enjoy them. It gives me an excuse to travel all these European cities and uh, meet friends. This time, he's flying out from Edinburgh on his way to a tournament in Utrecht in Holland. The weather was poor, but it's February in Scotland, so that's normal. I got to departures and they said there was a delay. The weather in Amsterdam was too poor to travel. In fact, air travel across much of the Atlantic seaboard of Europe has been disrupted by Storm Doris. This is a major weather system with terrifying wind gusts reaching speeds of nearly 100 miles an hour. I don't know if the weather got better, but we left two hours after we should have. Flybe BE1284 and its 59 passengers finally leave Edinburgh Turnhouse Airport at 2.10, en route for Schiphol Amsterdam Airport. Dutch plane spotter Michael Splinter is also on his way to Schiphol. There was a storm rolling in that day. It really makes it interesting for uh, people filming and probably for the pilots to land also and a bit anxious for the passengers inside. Gary is flying in a Bombardier Dash 8. I don't care much for travelling on these small planes, but uh, no choice. And he is hitting some severe weather as he approaches the Netherlands. It's bumpy going through the clouds as always, but it continued to rock and shake um, going below the clouds, so I knew it was windy. Down on the ground, Michael is shooting some dramatic footage of the planes coming into land on the east runway. The bigger runways at the airport are shut because of the wind. They use the shortest runway they have there. Normally they use it for business jets, but this day they almost use it for every flight. Because the other runways were closed down. Really crazy day. Uh, it is always great to be there when, uh, when the wind is going like this. It might be fun filming in these conditions, but Gary is not enjoying his roller coaster ride in the skies above Amsterdam. As we're approaching the runway, yeah, the plane was uh, rocking around and then it kept rocking all the way down. But these guys do this all the time. But these are truly exceptional weather conditions. At the time of the landing, it's estimated there were wind gusts of over 50 miles per hour. Yeah, you saw them approach and you see them make a little bit of a dive to the runway because it's a really small runway. The Dash 8 is battered by the fierce wind as it drops the last few meters to the ground. It would have been just approximately touchdown when the plane just sunk like a stone and crashed into the runway. You could hear the sound, the huge crack. And the plane kind of jumped for a second, and that was when, ah, uh, this is a problem. It was landing on the right landing gear first, and then a split second later, it slammed it to the ground with, uh, with the lift and the, the airplane banged. The propeller hit the ground, pinged away, and the wing scraped along the tarmac. Uh, sparks everywhere. It was getting closer to the grass 
And I thought, if that catches the grass, this could go horrible. The plane stops after scraping along the runway for more than 20 seconds. It come to a halt and everybody was quiet and calm. There wasn't much noise. Everybody looked around at each other and there was a few um, whoops. But the ordeal isn't quite over yet. The next thing was the horrendous smell of burning. So from being calm to that smell was a wee bit frightening because I thought, what's up here now? But it was just the stewardess opening the back door and it was a smell from the plate scraping the, along the runway. The stewardess then quickly shouted, hurry, hurry, everybody out, everybody out. And everybody stood up and they all ran out. It's, it's scary to see the people run out for their lives out of the airplane. It's difficult to watch also. Nobody was seriously injured, but Gary was badly shaken by the whole incident. He didn't compete in the tournament in Utrecht, and when he returned to Schiphol two days later, he just couldn't face the flight back to Edinburgh. I was looking at the plane, thinking, look at these little wheels, <laughs> look at these stupid propellers. So I says, no, I'm not going to go on this. Gary ended up taking the long way home. I got a bus from Amsterdam to Utrecht, Utrecht to Brussels, Brussels to Antwerp, Antwerp to Ghent, Ghent, Cali, Cali, London. Waited there for three hours. It was minus four, I remember. Eventually got on that bus and that went to Sheffield, then Leeds, Newcastle. Got to Edinburgh and that full trip was 34 and a half hours. <laughs> it was a horrendous journey, but I still felt like it was definitely worth it. March 2017, Lima, Peru. Lawyer Jessica Nunez Herrera is leaving her one-year-old son behind as she heads up country from the capital for a legal hearing. When the taxi came to collect me, my son started to cry. So I said goodbye to my little boy and he said I'll be back soon. She is flying out from Lima to the small regional city of Jauja. The airport had just been um, constructed very recently, maybe less than a month before this accident. It was a brand new runway. In fact, Peruvian Airlines had only just added to this new route from the capital. This part of the country is not accessible unless you take a bus or get in, climb into a car for hours. So people were really looking forward to being able to actually fly. Also taking advantage of the new route is archaeologist Moira Navoa Silva, who is working on a nearby dig. It seemed like a normal journey, the same as any other. It was a bit delayed, but the plane took off with no problems. The plane was in pretty good condition and didn't seem to have any technical defects at the time. It's only about a 40-minute journey, so before they know it, the 150 people on board flight P9112 are preparing to land. When the pilot was beginning to descend and telling the crew to prepare the cabin for landing, we took our seats and did up our seat belts. The view was pretty, it all looked calm. The pilot then announced, get ready, we're landing. Five, six seconds later, it all began. We were up there and it was like an elevator, but much more violent and we all fell down. The 737 makes an abrupt touchdown on the newly completed landing strip. The first impact with the runway felt very rough. I said, what the devil? And I thought, what happened? 
The people who were at the back felt the impact, and the plane started to move like this, and things fell down. From there, we started to feel a very rough impact. Everything happened in seconds. The plane scrapes along the runway, and the landing gear collapses. It crashed on its nose, and it started to skid. And it skidded and skidded and skidded. The plane was at an angle, and it started bouncing. I felt three, three thuds. We ended up in a ditch, which made the plane stop. After an estimated 100 meters, the plane grinds to a halt. We veered off track completely, to the right-hand side, and there we balanced. And when we saw the smoke, people got desperate. They started shouting. I felt the smoke, the oxygen mass started falling, the compartments, the things, everything inside the plane was destroyed. Everyone was getting desperate. I thought that was it. I thought about my family. I said to myself, it was good up until now. The final report on the reasons behind the crash has not yet been completed. But various accounts have been published. The pilot said that he lost control of the plane when one of the tires exploded once he touched down on the ground. It was a windy day, so that could have affected the plane's handling as well. What is known is that the aeroplane ended up in flames close to the perimeter fence of Hauha Airport. When I heard the air hostess saying, leave, leave, my soul forgot my body, it was a very hard moment. It still shocks me. And everyone began to get out in whatever way they could, and that was it. I got up and said, right, you have to leave. In desperation, I didn't lower myself out. I practically threw myself off. There was an explosion when we were getting out. I shout, get out, please, because I was scared that there were still people inside. Well, I was frightened. I was scared. Because I had been there. I'd been on the plane. The whole thing could have exploded. And thanks to that, we had a chance to get out. And then the whole thing went up in flames. The fire is worse than it might have been because the plane is still carrying a significant fuel load. The airline said that refueling was not available at the Hau Ha airport, and so the plane's tank was quite full. So when the engine hit the ground, it broke, and that caused the explosion and therefore the fire. Once she has moved a safe distance from the burning 737, Moira quickly gets in touch with her family and sends her mum hard evidence she has escaped from the burning wreck in one piece. When I got out, the first thing I did was film the plane and send it to my family's WhatsApp group to tell them I was OK. At that moment, my mum got worried. She thought the worst. I told her, I'm fine. Watch the video, watch the video. I said, I'm fine. So that's why I had to take a selfie, because otherwise my mum wasn't going to believe that I was OK. There were no fatalities in this accident. However, there were reports that 29 of the 150 people on board were taken to hospital. Moira didn't suffer any major medical problems, but the crash has changed her outlook on life. We should make the most of life. Enjoy each minute with our family, our friends, because you never know the moment death will come to you. January 2017, London, England. Chef Simon Johnson is heading out for a few days of fun in Thailand. 
After flying down from Newcastle, he boards British Airways Flight 9 at Heathrow. The plane leaves just after 3 p.m. The, the flight was really quiet. Um, like I've not noticed anything all the way through the flight. Got my meal, happy with my meals that I got, um, happy with the service of the cabin crew. But the peace and quiet comes to a sudden end as the plane gets close to its Bangkok destination. Uh, the captain came over saying, uh, we're getting ready to land. So I thought, right, I'll go to the toilet. But as Simon waits patiently for his comfort break, he gets a very painful surprise. Next thing, I get a thud in my back, lower back. And I turn around and this guy's running back to his seat. Um, and I <clears throat> just go straight to the cabin crew and tell them, I've just been assaulted by that gentleman down there. Um, and they said, yeah, we're aware, aware of him, situation with him uh, already. So I went back to my seat. As the 777 continues to Bangkok, one of the flight attendants goes to speak to what turns out to be a Russian passenger and gets an aggressive response. This is when I undo my belt, my seat belt, and help the cabin crew by restraining this Russian back into his seat. This is where I'm actually just coming up now. We're trying to hold him down, but I've had to come up with him. After six years of dealing with drunks outside of Darlington nightclubs, Simon is in familiar territory. As an ex doorman, you could see the situation on, on the aeroplane was getting out of control. Other passengers join in to pin down the rowdy Russian. The guy just so strong, you just can't. Australian. While bystanders get caught up in the melee. The lady here getting trapped. She's trying to get out. <laughs> We're trying to hold him down into his seat. He'd broken his seat, plus the two seats in front of him. From his pure strength, the one cabin crew member that was left, he ran off. Because we said, have you got the handcuffs? I said, do we need, do we really need them? I said, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really need them. So they went for the handcuffs. As the Mile High Fight Club waits for the restraints to come back, Simon's training kicks in. When you're in a situation and you've got it under control, you signal the rest of the door staff around the, uh, the club to say everything's OK. I spot the guy with the camera to say we're OK now. Give him the thumbs up. The crew come back with their handcuffs, but they aren't enough to tame this Russian bear. The body restraints were so thin, they didn't really work. They, you know, it was up and down, up and down. And we're just trying to keep him into his seat, but he was just oh, like that all the time. He was just so strong. By the time the plane makes its final approach, Simon has withdrawn from the fray with back problems. I had to step out because my back had gone into full spasm um, and another gentleman moved into where I was sitting. With the Soviet strongman under the watchful eyes of the volunteer posse, BA Flight 9 finally puts down in Bangkok. The pilot said, take your seats, and that's when the Thai police came on, uh, with all guns blaring. <laughs> but they wouldn't take him off. Now you see the Thai police going off. <laughs> So it was down to passengers and crew again uh, to take him off. The cabin crew found um, a litre bottle of Jack Daniels, empty litre bottle of Jack Daniels, I should say, under his, under his seat. Now unsteady on his feet, Simon is one of the last passengers to disembark. As he leaves, he gets one final glimpse of the belligerent Russian. Walking off the plane onto that sky bridge bit, we had to physically uh, be lifted over um, eight Thai policemen that were on top of the Russian guy. We were still kicking off, even with the handcuffs on and the body restraints. He was on the floor with eight Thai policemen on top of him. 